What would happen if we punched planet Earth? I mean, all of us at once, we all got together in one place, around 7 billion of us, and we all punched planet Earth. Earth. I got this question on Twitter, and I know it's analogous to another question that a colleague of mine has answered, Vsauce, but I wanted to tackle this one because I thought it was very interesting. What if we got everyone together and we punched the Earth all at once? Well, how many of us are there? That's where you would start, right? There are around 7 billion humans on the planet Earth. It's probably too many. And the average punching force of a person is harder to come up with than you may expect. So why don't we go to the value of the most punchiest people on the planet that we know of so far? heavyweight boxers. Now, a good value for the punching power of a heavyweight boxer is around a thousand pounds force which is quite a lot. Now, if we take that 1,000 pounds force times 7 billion people, we would add the nine zeros to the three zeros of 1,000 pounds force, and we get about 7 trillion pounds of force. Now, that sounds like a lot, but remember what the planet Earth is doing. Right now, it is tumbling through space with an incredible amount of momentum. It has a lot of mass, it has a lot of velocity. So if we all got on one side of the Earth, perhaps in the direction opposite that it is orbiting the sun, what would it actually do? Well, you can do this with a very simple uh, force equals mass times acceleration equation. Let's isolate everyone's fist punching against the planet Earth. What would it do in terms of acceleration to the planet? Well, why don't we take the mass of Earth and we divide the force that we just found, 7 trillion pounds of force, we divide that force by the mass to get the acceleration, F equals MA. And if we do that, I get a value in terms of Gs of about uh, 1 times 10 to the negative 10 or 11. So a trillionth almost of a G. This is almost nothing. This is pretty close to the smallest possible acceleration we have ever measured in the lab. Practically speaking, this would do nothing. Even though it sounds impressive, the Earth is not a rigid sphere. And in these physics problems and equations, we consider the Earth like a rigid sphere. But the Earth is not a rigid sphere. It is a squishy squishy. So if we were all to punch the Earth at once, the Earth would deform in such a way that it probably wouldn't have any real effect on the planet at all. However, we are talking about a planetary scale here. What if we drop back down to the human scale? All of this force, if you take the force and you multiply it by a stopping distance, let's say that you can punch into the ground about half the distance of your fist. It's a stopping distance. All that force coming to a stop within maybe an inch, inch and a half. Now, if that's the case, you can uh, equate this using the work energy equation, and you find that the amount of energy all these people will be punching the Earth at once with is equivalent to about a one, oh, sorry, oh, it's live, about a 4.7 magnitude earthquake. So while the Earth may not change very much at all, I feel like the people in this area would certainly feel it. And not just feel it underneath their feet. There'd probably be many broken hands. And then think about the humanitarian disaster this would be. Seven billion people in a very small area. Many with broken hands, no medical equipment. There's not enough transportation to get them out to the surrounding hospitals. The surrounding hospitals in the near area are absolutely flooded by people shocking the healthcare system into absolute collapse in the, in the area. And then the economy follows soon after. <laughs> if everyone punched the earth at once... I think it would be an absolute catastrophe. Hello, and welcome to something new that I am trying. I'm calling this Office Hours. It's kind of like a video podcast that I want to do. We are all, uh, I'm locked down in the facility right now, and I thought maybe I could try to simulate something that I always enjoyed when I was a student, Office Hours. So when I was having a problem 
uh, when I was having a problem in class or I was, uh, I wanted more curiosity, uh, something to satiate my curiosity, I would go to my professor's office hours. A lot of people didn't take advantage of that, but I ended up being, uh, becoming friends with many of my professors and, um, those relationships have lasted and I learned many new things and I, I was able to stretch out my educational experience beyond just normal class hours. So I want to try to do something like that for all of you if I can at all. So this will be office hours. We will be going through a number of pre-selected topics in kind of a podcasty way. But I will also be taking all of your questions from the chat. And yes, we have the technology to do that kind of thing. I'm monitoring chat right now and chat is live. Obviously, we already talked about punching the planet a little later on. I want to talk about why it feels like time is stretching out right now during this period why it feels to us as though time uh, march lasted like 10 marches why well there's some psychology behind that in my colleague here uh nessie hill has some uh, n no relation has some uh, good uh good psychological advice on that and i want to talk about the anniversary of the first person to orbit the planet earth yuri gagarin but uh like i said let's go to the chat, the chat is happening live right now. I may or may not be semi-transparent. That's a side effect of a couple of things that I'm experimenting with in the facility. It has nothing to do with personal invisibility or anything like that. So let's go to the chat right now and answer some of your questions before we get into things. Do we have the technology to do that? <laughs> do we have the technology to do that? So... Let's, that's, we already talked about that. One sec. <laughs> okay, so we are going to the chat here. Uh, it's, it's, it's all here, baby. Uh, will this podcast be on Spotify? I am doing this as kind of a test case. I want to see if this is going to be good as a format, something I want to continue doing. So no plans to have it on, uh, on uh, podcast apps right now. I know I'm calling it a podcast, but it's more like a video podcast. I want to try it out right now. I know, I'm streaming. I would love to try to do uh, something analogous to Twitch streaming, but for science. Uh, Jonathan365 asks, do you like your new way of making videos? Um, I love the facility. I love the, uh, the uh, canon, the world building it affords me to do interesting things from inside of this place, to come up with my own stories and to kind of flesh out a more uh, narrative, inclusionary uh, science communication. I, I think that was, when you look around at really successful businesses and, and operations and, and community-driven things like, like this, I think a lot of it has to do with world-building and narrative, and that's what I get to do with the facility, and me and my staff are doing that each and every day uh, on the Patreon and on the Discord. There's like 600 people that I'm talking with in our private chat rooms uh, every day. It's, it's, ab it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, yeah. Uh, my question, uh, Jake Anderson says, my question is, how are you? I'm pretty good. I'm very lucky in that my job affords me to the ability to stay home right now. I know a lot of people, a lot of essential workers do not have the ability to stay home right now. So, uh, of course, uh, ponytails off to all of them. I mean, hats, sorry. Uh, hats off to all of them, but I'm very lucky that I get to be in here doing this kind of thing right now. Um, so my, uh, my, my, my life hasn't really changed all, all that much. Um, Someone just mentioned Tom Scott. I would love to do a collaboration with Tom Scott. Uh, I feel bad because I only just kind of discovered him, but he's an absolutely fantastic science communicator. I would love to do something with him. Um, what else? Let's talk about... Uh, so uh, let, me just, let me just get this right out there. Uh... I won't be talking about anything because science related, because science was something that I did for a number of years. Um, I'm very proud of the work that I did there, and now I'm doing something different. And uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Uh, and if you're wondering, here in the facility, I am the administrator of the facility. So I am running, directing, producing, researching, writing, 
everything myself by myself all the time. Sorry, I'm just looking at questions. My wife would like to know if you're staying hydrated. You know I am. Uh, Kyle asked, would you uh, consider playing D&D or something like that? Or, you know, it's something... I've never played D&D. Um, I feel like I'd be fine at it and I would like doing it. But... Um, I always wanted to do, I want to do a full episode on the bag of holding and uh, how it can have this interior volume that's bigger than its exterior uh, appearance of volume and uh, how long it would take a creature to actually suffocate in there. I actually did the math on that. So, <laughs> uh, Brandon Dietrich asks, do I enjoy my job? I am not a spiritual person. I am not a uh, kind of... Uh, religious person, but uh, I would say that I think I'm pretty good at science communication, and uh, if, if there was a, any truth behind, like, you're meant to do something, I feel like I'm meant to do science communication, so I, I very much like to do my job. So I'm gonna go back to labs here. Oh, you guys. Oh, all of you. So, now, let's move on to our, we'll get back to you, chat. We'll get back to you in a, in a second. Let's move on right now. We're broadcasting. Wait, let me just, is the monitor working all right? I mean, all the, I mean, all the wires seem like they're in the right place back here. Perfect. So, why does time feel like it's spreading out so much right now? Why does, why does every day, why, why do you, why do we, why are we feeling uh, the loss of time? I, <laughs> I wake up almost every day asking like, what, wait, what day is it? Like, what week is it? What, what time is it? And my friend uh, and colleague, uh, Vanessa Hill over on the brain, no relation, over on the brain craft channel uh, from PBS Digital Studio, Studio. she works with uh, Physics Girl, It's Okay to Be Smart, she has a fantastic new video on this. I recommend that you watch it. But she goes through the psychology of how time feels like it's stretching out during events like this. And uh, I won't summarize her whole video. That's what her video is for. But there are a few key things to keep in mind. Uh, one of them is that the perception of time passing is somehow wired into our brains to be correlated with the, the salience of events, how how much we feel those events and how much they affect us. So right now, um, it's scary out there. New things, novel things are happening every day, and we are paying you know almost minute by minute attention to all uh, all of the latest updates and uh, you know what what's going on in the rest of the world. And because of this, every moment we're we're ascribing more and more emotional salience, more uh, emotional data, if you will to every passing moment. And when this happens, when we go back in our memories, we tend to, we, we feel as though time is stretching out, that each moment has more informational content, but that is an illusion. It's an illusion because in reality, time isn't passing slower, and uh, Vanessa gets to, of course time isn't passing slower, we're not traveling at the speed of light or anything, but uh, Vanessa mentions a number of cool psychological experiments to get at this perception of time. So, uh, scientists took people basically uh, bungee jumping without the bungee jump part, without the rope part. They had a giant safety net underneath them, and what they did was strap watches to these people, and they said, we're going to drop you backwards like a hundred feet down into a safety net, and we want you to watch your watch as best as possible and uh, describe how much time you feel has passed. And so there was this prevailing notion in psychology that um, when something dangerous, when something important, when something uh, adrenaline rushing happens, our brains slow down time. Our perception, our breadth of perception increases as though our, the frame rate of the world is increasing. But what they found was basically people's perception of time was equivalent whether or not they were looking at a watch 
not dropping or they were dropping. So this kind of got, uh, this got away from this idea that uh, our brains slowed down perception when something scary or dangerous was happening. So uh, what they found was this emotional salience. So when you think back on an event that was scary or uh, life-changing or novel or new, you tend to uh, you tend to thumbtack more bits of data to that because it's new, scary, emotional. You tend to attack bits of data, and then when you go back and recall that information, your brain is interpreting more data as more time, which I guess makes sense evolutionarily. It's like you were experiencing more. Well, it seems like more experience happened here. It probably happened over a longer time. That's not a bad evolutionary trait to have. But consider this difference between something like driving down the highway, you know, driving to school or to work for the thousandth time, the 500th time, you almost can't even remember driving to work once you got out of the car. And that's because uh, the car, the drive, no longer has this salience. It's no longer important. You can almost do it on autopilot, and you can for real if you drive a Tesla, but you can do it on, like, conscious autopilot where you're not even really conscious of what you're doing. You're thinking about other things and driving. But if suddenly a car accident happened in front of you, this is something very new, very uh, salient uh, to your experience, very emotional, very scary, and then it can seem like time is slowing down. And so that is what uh, Vanessa and what psychologists would, um, would probably say is happening right now. Every day feels like it's, it's elongating or embiggening, if you will, because every day has something new, has something scary, has something emotional happening. Uh, you probably know people in your lives or uh, you know people that know people that are being affected directly by this or having loved ones um, affected directly by this. So time is stretching out, but it's an illusion. I don't know, people in the chat were, have been saying like, dude, it's been 1.15 for like 15 or 30 minutes. No, I, I, I absolutely understand. Uh, so let's get back to the chat. What's, what's everyone saying? <laughs> Robbie Rose says it's kind of like Vats from Fallout. Eh, yeah, I, I guess I could see an analogy where you're, you're putting so much mental focus on something and it seems like time is slowing down. I could see that. What else does the chat have to say? Uh, Gibbol says, uh, when you're listening to podcasts, like this might be one day, uh, podcasts make it seem like time can stretch out when you're doing something that you've done for a long, long time, uh, like uh, driving a car or something like that. When you, you uh, uh, NPR, for example, National Public Radio, has, uh, has kind of trademarked or branded these moments as the... Uh, uh, stay in the driveway or the driveway moments and I'm sure you've had these when you've been listening to a fantastic uh, podcast or radio show or what have you you know this American life and you've gotten home but you've stayed in your car and you're listening in the driveway because you can't stop this is one of those instances where you feel like time is extending a little bit because something new um, something remarkable uh, James Wake says, yeah, kind of like slow-mo in Dread. If you haven't seen the new Dread, I watched the new Dread in like 2012, but I watched the new Dread like once a month. Man, man, is that movie fantastic. I absolutely love it. Uh, hey, Science Fabio, Prisoner says, uh, what about a hollow earth like in the TV show Sanctuary? Well, uh, Prisoner, 24601, Two, four, six, oh, one. I would point you to a recent episode uh, that we did at the facility about can hollow planets exist? There you go. Uh, Edigar CM is spamming the chat saying, explain capsule corpse. So uh, this is kind of similar to what I've talked about before in terms of capturing Pokemon. So if you're not familiar in Dragon Ball Z, they have a capsule corporation and they have made billions upon billions of dollars by uh, figuring out how figuring out how to shrink large objects, put them in little capsules, and then you can resize them later just by hitting the top of the capsule as if you were Sonic at the end of Green Hill Zone 1. So how... So... <laughs> how physics would say this might be possible, even though it's not practically possible, would be to decrease the distance between an electron and the nucleus of 
the atom. So uh, electrons spin around the nucleus of an atom, and they, they're not really single centralized like little balls. It's more like a cloud of probability of where an electron might be. But if you could theoretically decrease the distance at which this cloud was orbiting, because um, objects are solid and because objects don't pass through each other because of the electrical repulsion from these surface electrons on atoms, then theoretically, if you could shrink the orbital distance, then materials as a whole could come closer together because the electrical repulsion is dependent on where these electrons are. So if you did that by some factor, you could shrink some object by a factor of 10, 100, a million, or what have you, and then you could get it down to fit in a capsule. How you would do that? Bombarding stuff with muons to make electrons heavier, to get them to orbit closer, because that's how you know momentum work, momentum uh, conservation momentum works. But that's all incredibly just theoretical and not practical. <laughs> yeah, Rune uh, 12358 says, yeah, that would mess up a lot of stuff. Yeah, the human body, and this relates to Ant-Man quite a bit, but the human body right now, I am because I'm a hot boy, uh, I am radiating about 100 watts of body heat. And this is uh, dependent on my surface area as well, right? So I can only radiate out heat dependent on how much of my body is being shown to the environment to radiate it outwards. If I suddenly shrunk down to the size of an ant, for example, then I'm radiating the same amount of body heat on one thousandth one millionth of the surface area and so i would overheat very very quickly i'd probably boil alive in my own suit but i didn't don't tell paul rudd that how does the tardis work no idea i mean it would be some some folding of space and time happening that's weird timey wimey you know whatever what else we got in the chat going on Hmm, could you reach the point where ele Wayne Gaming asks, could you reach the point where electrons don't move and then squeeze them together closer? I think that's less of a problem. Um I think what you're what you're interpreting there is actually temperature. So um temperature is the bouncing around of uh material. Uh the bouncing around of particles, and then uh, when it hits something, basically the energy of the impact, the kinetic energy of particles is what we call temperature. So um, if you had a number, if you had a gas in a box and you heated up that gas, the particles would be moving faster and hit the edges of the, the box more often and harder, and it would heat up the edges of the box, relatively speaking, because of energy transfer between these little collisions, these trillions of little collisions, and this heats the box up. Now, if you slowed everything down to absolute zero, you still have quantum jiggling. You always got quantum jiggling. Always got the jiggling. But more or less, there's no temperature. Um, this would still have the electrons at some distance. And I, I, I don't know, to answer your question fully, I don't know what would happen. Um, you know that for most substances, when they freeze, their volume contracts. So uh, solids are the most compact, and then liquids are less so, and then uh, gases are the least so. Um, that's not true for all materials. For example, water, the reason why we can live, the reasons why uh, oceans can sustain life through the wintertime, is because ice actually expands a little bit when you freeze it, and so it floats on the surface of water because of the difference in density. So not all materials do that, but... Um, yeah, I think I think decreasing electron distance with the atom, the Bohr radius, if you want to look it up, would be a closer way at getting at um, Ant-Man style shrinking something. Uh, Oscar Martinez, because I have to, uh, says, "What's your favorite new magic card from the new sets?" Uh, I'm one of the precon commanders, uh, Calamax, my boy Calamax, like a Stegosaurus that copies instants and sorceries. Oh, just instance? Uh, he looks fantastic to me. But that, that's enough. Um, what's the name? <laughs> Nick Suarez asks, what's the name of this little guy on my desk? Well, I only know it as Specimen 246. Uh, but if I had to... Hey. Hey. What you doing back there? What you doing up there? Ah, man. 
if I had to name it, I don't know. I can't speak its language. We're working on that, though. We're working on that. <laughs> Ross King points out where uh, I just said a bunch of jiggling, um, and that was uh, that was Feynman. And I actually watched a full documentary about Richard Feynman last night, so I'm feeling very Feynman-esque. Isn't it? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I can't do a New York accent like he has, but um, I love the way he'd explain things, you see. And he'd talk about... It's quite fun to imagine why you slip on the ice. What, what is it that's slipping against, against each other? Well, we're told that because ice expands when it's frozen, that when you're pressing down on the ice with something like a, an ice skate, that pressure reverses the process, goes back to water, gives you a little bit of a slipping surface. It's fun to imagine. He's fantastic, man. An actual genius. Um... <laughs> I'm not going to call him... No, I'm not going to... Uh, Professor Drew, no, Chonkita is not current... My cat... Chonkita is not currently in the facility. I... I I mean, there's a lot of air ducts, but I barred the doors this time, so she can't physically push the door <laughs> open to get in here. Uh, Pin Up Mariposa, I believe, just said something about um, this, the, the, the pandemic that's currently going on. So I think, I think people need to realize that uh, this is not going to be a one and done thing. The, the way that these kinds of illnesses work, um, this is gonna be closer to the flu. It's probably gonna be seasonal. Um, uh, which is to say that even if we perfectly socially distance right now, Probably in the winter, probably in uh, spring, we're going to see another wave of this come back. Um, even if there's vaccines, it's going to be closer to the flu. What is so heartbreaking about this is that epidemio epidemiologically speaking, if we could all not see any of us, like if we could all perfectly socially distance, not come into a contact with a, another human being for three weeks or thereabouts, this disease would die and be eradicated. Crazy, right? Crazy to think about. If every human being on the earth could right now perfectly socially distance, this disease would die in three weeks and it'd be fine. But we can't. It's necessary for human functioning, for human society right now, for us to be in contact with other people, at least a little bit. And so that's kind of the heartbreaking point, uh, point I want to make is that the science says, like, this is a good way of dealing with this. But because we're human beings, we can't fully deal with it that way. It's kind of, yeah. So this is probably going to be a seasonal thing. Uh, yearly, you might need to get a yearly vaccine for it. Um, and social distancing is, be, is going to be woven into the fabric of our lives, really. I mean, this is something where it's like, uh, we should, uh, oh, it's, you know, it's this time of year. It's time to practice social distancing every year. Um, it might change how we eat, how we learn, how we teach, how we work. This is, this is pointing out a lot of areas in society where we need to have, <laughs> where we wanted to ask these questions for a long time, but this is forcing us to ask those questions. What is an essential job? Can people work from home? For, for what you're talking about. So, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's something. <laughs> Alvaro de Hoyos asks, why is your mug on your desk so small? <laughs> That's a, we have big people here at the facility. That's not mine. This is my mug, and it's appropriately sized. But that mug is for... Uh, I, like to pay, I like to play a joke on some of the facility staff members. Sometimes... I mean, we've kind of gotten at that capsule corp, corp technology a little bit here at the facility. So I like to shrink random things uh, for some of my professors and leave it on their desk and try to make them imagine that they're turning into giants just to freak them out. When they come back into their office, they're like, something's wrong. Am I huge now? <laughs> it's a, it, I'm a fun boss. It's a fun thing that we, that we do. Nathan S. asks, can I have a hug? No, even if we weren't social distance, distancing. If you know me, you know that. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. 
That's why I don't go to conventions anymore. Too much touching me. Without asking. Uh, so we're almost at the halfway-ish point, you know. I, but I'm having fun. Let's let's keep. Uh, I'm having. I haven't dropped a single frame. I'm new to this streaming thing. I think. I mean, pretty pretty decent. Let me just check the monitor here. Uh, the Spirit Bomb asks, will this episode be available later? Yes, this is going to go up right on the YouTube channel right after this, so if you missed any of it, we can talk about it later. Uh, Lion of High Park asks, uh, I don't have a question, I just want to congratulate you on the new show and the new format. Thank you. This is... Um I, I can't say I can't say too much, but um, this has been a labor of love, and uh, I'm really happy with it turned with how it turned out with the style with the design. I mean, look, look how look how quickly the contractors put you know all this up, and it's and you know it, it's fantastic. I, I'm very happy uh, uh, where we are right now, and how I get to talk directly with you in this kind of way. We haven't done this kind of thing before. <laughs> Mick Piven asks the, the amazing question: Why are there uh, X-rays? Mick Piven, come on! Why? What, what's? What are those X-rays? Well, if you look close, I'm trying to figure out where the face hugger, the hugging part goes, and that's a sonogram. It gets pretty rough in here sometimes. Uh. Bullwick, uh, one of the professor emeritus at my facility, uh, asks, how important do you think ethics are in scientific discovery? Uh, I mean, we wouldn't have science in the way that we would without ethics. I mean, there's this, hmm. I mean, I, 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 I will say it's, it's not like it's not alluring. I mean, and this is the premise of like games like Bioshock and, you know, Ayn Randian kind of philosophy, where if uh, science didn't have any ethics, we could do so many more experiments and, and, and terrible experiments and treat people like test subjects without their approval. And we could learn a lot of things. That is true. I mean, we we could take two babies and raise one in a chamber, you know, that has secondhand smoke for 10 years and raise them together and see what happens. We could do that kind of thing and we probably would learn a lot about what smoking does to human physiology, but we started doing things like that. It's a slippery slope, right? Because of all that jiggling, but, it, but it's a slippery slope and uh, we would erode the social contract that science and scientists have with the public where it's less trusted, it's more, it would be more conspiratorial. What are they going to do? Who are they testing on? What's happening? Um, ethics is not just a fabric of society. It's a fabric of science and how we do science. And I, I, I think we would have less trust in science and scientists if you knew they, that ethics was not a problem. If you didn't have a theory of mind for scientists, knowing how they would treat you treat you the way they want to be treated, you know, so a lot of things break down when you don't have uh, ethics in the mix. Uh, Emmanuel Cisternas asks, I'm pronouncing everything with kind of a Latin flair to it. Uh, will Tuesdays be question and answer days? Um, well, I mean, if you, I want to see how this does. Right now, I'm enjoying, uh, I'm enjoying what we're doing here during the stream. We have about as many people as, as I had back, uh, during other live streaming times, uh, so I would I would say that yeah I mean we could make Tuesday live from the facility day, and I'd love to do that. I'd like to do this weekly with all of you. So if you are all, uh, if you are down for that, let me know in the comments. Like this video, share this video. Uh, the better it does, the more likely I am to do it. That is just <laughs> that's just the situation now. Um, because science was a thing that I was I was doing, and regardless of. Uh, Anyway, uh, I would like to make this new content that I would uh, do weekly, and it would be uh, important to all of you. That's what that's what I want. Quinn uh, Kowiski asks, uh, "What happened to Discount Thor? What are you talking about, baby? Who? Right here." Although I'm more of a science Geralt these days, which I kind of like. Yeah. Uh. Could you connect 
Could you connect the moon to Earth by a rope? I mean, theoretically, yes, there is some force you could attach the Earth to the moon with, and it would, the tension force, there, there is a, an answer to that question. And we've asked this question with something like, uh, with a, a concept like a space elevator. How strong would cable need to be to attach an elevator uh, to the end of it and use the centrifugal force of Earth to uh, tension that, make it so you can go up and down in a space elevator? This would be a space elevator to the moon, I suppose. But... We can do that math right now, and I have before, and I might uh, do an episode on it, but uh, right now there's no known material that could withstand that stress. Even uh, many, 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 many uh, cables of carbon nanotubes in a macro structure built up into this giant thick cable, still not strong enough. So right now there's even the strongest materials in the best configuration would not account for the forces involved. So not right now. Uh, yeah, maybe I can do that. I, I probably should turn on slow mode in the chat, but I don't... I, I got a lot of buttons and doodads here and I'm checking on the monitor cables right now, so I'll do that next time, but not right now. Oh. Um, yeah, Shane Riley. Hey, uh, Shane Riley asks... What about a cure for dementia? I only ask because my dad suffers from dementia. Well, first of all, I'm incredibly sorry. Uh, I know how difficult that can be, and it's um, it's terrifying. I can't imagine. I mean, the idea of losing yourself is is one of the worst things I can think of. Uh, so let's, uh, everyone, I mean, hearts, and uh, go out to you. Um, we don't, we don't have a cure for it. We don't fully understand it. Um, and I'm not abreast of the research. Um, I know there's a lot of inroads being made, uh, dementia, Alzheimer's related, uh, neurological conditions, but, um, I'm not abreast of the research. What I, what I, what I do want to say, I guess, is just, um, I, I acknowledge how, how, how rough that probably is for you. And I'm, and I'm sorry, but I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Christopher Russell says, Toss a coin to your geek. This is his facility. This is his facility. I can't actually sing it or else I'll, uh, I'll get demonetized. Um, yeah, uh, Oscar, Mart uh, Oscar Martinez asks again, uh, another question. What are your thoughts on doing like uh, science-y Let's Plays like Subnautica or FTL or something like that? I would love to. There's actually, if you go to my Patreon right now, it's patreon.com slash Kyle Hill. I have, uh, just because... Being the administrator here, I am fully on the line in funding this entire operation. So right now we have a goal where uh, if we reach a certain amount of um, of uh, of members in the staff in the facility, um, I would like to start a Twitch channel where we could combine this format with a live streaming format. I'd love to do this with y'all for hours, where we could go um, and just start doing gameplay interspersed with talking to the chat. That's something we could definitely do. Uh, Magnus, uh, Simonson, I apologize if I, if I didn't, uh, say that correctly. Is it possible there are stronger materials in the universe that we don't know anything about? Yes, it's absolutely possible. Uh, I mean, there's even theoretically possible materials that are, uh, stronger than something like, uh, carbon nanotubes where you're getting down to, like, fundamentally the strength of atomic bonds in between uh, in between all the atoms in, in, in some structure. And we kind of got at this in the, uh, hollow earth episode where, uh, I was saying that to sustain a shell for a shell to be rigid and not collapse inward on itself, like a Dyson sphere would around a sun, if it wasn't strong enough, it would have to be stronger than ordinary matter. Like there's forces that would overcome just the interatomic bonds of a material. Like it would just, it would just obliterate itself. Um, so there probably are stronger materials in something like carbon nanotubes and we haven't discovered yet. That's, that's absolutely possible. Uh, yeah, let me just, let me just point out real quick while we're, while we're doing this, if you're spamming the chat, if you're saying anything, uh, you know, offensive or anything like that, it will be an instant ban and removal. I am, not literally iron-fisted, but I am iron-fisted 
when it comes to community. If you're being intentionally crappy, if you're making people feel weird, this is, this is my building. You can get out. And I, that's it. No second chances. So everyone be, everyone be nice in there. <laughs> no, I don't think Pickle Rickum would be uh, a material. So let's move on a little bit. I want to go and talk about this young man. This young man, he's a handsome guy, isn't he? So this is a, oh, I guess we're kind of looking right at each other. This <laughs> is uh, Yuri Gagarin. Um, he is known most famously, of course, as the first person to orbit the planet Earth. And uh, I think two days ago, yesterday, I don't even, what day is it? But uh, this was uh, at least uh, around the country, they celebrate uh, Yuri's Night. Uh, lots of space organizations celebrate Yuri's Night as it was the anniversary of the first um, human to orbit the planet Earth. And I just, I don't have a whole lot to say about this this young man other than uh, he was he was incredibly courageous to do this kind of thing, to, to get up in, in a rocket and basically sit on top of a controlled explosion and then orbit the planet at kilometers per second where he was going so fast in his capsule that his capsule, if you're American or you like soccer, his capsule could cross an American soccer field or an American soccer, a soccer field or an American football field before a bullet fired from a nine millimeter handgun, a nine millimeter bullet, he could cross that field in his capsule before the bullet reached like the five yard line. So to sit atop a controlled explosion and then fling yourself around six trillion trillion kilograms of mostly rock and a little bit of human biofilm uh, uh, around it was very, very courageous. He was, um, it was his only space flight. He was training to do another space flight when he was unfortunately killed um, during a uh, test flight a couple weeks later or a couple months later. Um, but uh, cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin, wow. I, <laughs> if I had the opportunity to go to space, I think I would absolutely take it. But would I put myself in his position? I honestly don't know if I if I would have the guts. I mean, this is why you get, this is why you get uh, the expression, you know, the right stuff when it comes to astronauts. You have to be a certain kind of person. I mean, I mean, it makes me think of uh, Commander Chris Hadfield, who told the uh, the Canadian uh, ISS commander, who I'm sure you all are familiar with, nice guy with a mustache. Um, but it reminds me of the story that he told, where he was trying to keep cool under pressure, and that's what these uh, men and women are so good at being so trained and so smart and so clever that under extreme adversity, they can still pull off something amazing. So uh, I believe Commander Hadfield was out on a spacewalk and uh, something got in his eye. Was it soap or like a fleck of dust or anything? Some, something like that. Anyway, something got in his eye and because of that, his eye started tearing up. And as you may have seen from some of his videos, surface tension of water and the lack of gravity is enough such that the tears will pool over your eye as if the as if you were laying down and the tears were creating a little pool inside of your eye that's what happened because in uh because of microgravity so the tears didn't run down his face so now he has pools of water over his eyes and he is a he is functionally blind on a spacewalk where if he misses a tether or something like that he's floating out in the void never to return and to have a terrible demise but he remembered his training, he remembered what to do, and he was able to calmly and coolly uh, communicate with, uh, with the ground, with his team, and finish what he needed to do. I forget exactly how he got the fluid out of his eye, but think of yourself in that position for a second, where you, something is pooling over your eye, you are, in one of the, you are in maybe the most dangerous position that a human can be in, and then you can't touch your face. You have a giant visor over it and bulky gloves. You can't touch your, you want to touch your face, get something out of the, one of the most sensitive parts of your body, but you can't and you have to stay cool and calm or else you are going to die. In, oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, Scott Wolf points out was it was the anti-fogging stuff in his visor, but uh, that was, what a story. Uh, Music Hernandez asks, what is this about? <laughs> 
This is Office Hours, a live stream slash podcast where I come from the sil- from the facility to talk to you about this week in science, sciencey things, and I also talk to you in the chat. I'm just a science guy, you know. I'm not a PhD. I'm not a working scientist, but uh, I run an entire facility where all we do is think about nerdy things and make content for you. So if you have a question for me, music, it's kind of a nice name, huh? You can put it in the chat, and maybe I will get to it. Yeah, uh, Derek Casagrande, a frequent commenter on everything that I've ever done. Yeah, no sight. Imagine being in space, no sight, no sound, uh, no real sense of what is up, what is down. That sounds like hell, man. <laughs> Jay Animate says, I would break the glass. No, you wouldn't. First of all, I bet you couldn't. Actually, uh, there was something fantastic in the, um, in the Expanse, I believe. If it wasn't the Expanse, then it was Lost in Space. Either or. Both pretty good space shows. They got something in their visor, and they lifted up their visor to get it out while in space, and then they close it again. And that, because of Hollywood, that seems like, oh, wouldn't that be instant death? Wouldn't your, you know, your eyes pop out, and you'd be, you know, all, like, uh, total recall, like, ah, give these people air. No. If you breathed out before opening your visor, you want to do that because the differential pressure inside of your lungs, like 15 pounds per square inch and zero pounds per square inch in the void, if you hold your breath, then expose yourself to vacuum, your lungs will, uh, the air in your lungs will force its way out of your mouth. And it will do so so quickly that it will freeze your tongue and your airways and your lungs and it will damage them. And it might rupture your alveoli and you might die. So breathe out if you're about to go into vacuum. But... If you need to get something out of your visor, breathe out, repressurize. It's theoretically possible, if not extremely dangerous. Oh, it was in the Expanse season one, people are telling me. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) have I not said how amazing the Expanse is enough? It's just, it's the most accurate show on television, and it's, it's it's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, people are saying Lost in Space is a quality show. It is a quality show. I actually, I met the creator of it, the of the new one, on a plane, and I was talking with him about uh, doing stuff with it. They're, they're all incredibly uh, nice and interesting people. Is, uh, is OGMB jumps hoops? Yeah, uh, um, uh, Matterbeam was in the chat earlier, OG Matterbeam. Yeah, I'm always talking about this expanse. And yes, it was a fine... Arnold impression. How dare you? Let's go back to chat. Uh, Abdur uh, asked, Kyle, is there going to be a footnotes? Well, uh, like I said before, I was doing Because Science, and now I'm doing this. So uh, if, there is a be- if there is a footnotesy thing, it won't be exactly like that. Right now, I'm trying to combine basically my reactions to you and the chat and things I want to talk about in science that are interesting to me, like punching planets and Yuri Gagarin, uh, into what we're doing right now. This is already much longer than uh, previous live streams or episodes like that, so this will be up on the channel afterwards if you want to go and look at it later. Basti asked, is Star Wars realistic? No. What... (laughs) It's not like physics realistic, but what Star Wars really gets right and what I think is the staying power of it is how lived in Star Wars feels. So, you know, the set designers, the producers, they all had a fantastic idea of what Star Wars should look like. It should look grungy. It should look uh, grungy and worked and lived in and the materials should look like they've been used and things should look old like they've been in this in this galaxy for a while. And that's what Star Wars really, really gets right, where some some sci-fi shows, I think, can look too pristine, where everything looks like, this is the future and it's all chrome. <laughs> Everything's going to be chrome in the future. You just wait. And we're all going to have high-waisted pants and no collars on our shirts. And we're all going to wear white. And we're going to be kind of androgynous. You know, um, I, I think what Star Wars showed was uh, that there could be many different kinds of futures. And, and that was a cool one that stuck with us in our public consciousness for a long, 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 long time. Uh, Steve Jester asked, My seven-year-old son and I love watching you. Much better than science from other sources. Thank you, Steve. And hello to your son. Um, you know, I don't... I, I don't do all of this, and I'll, well, let me check my monitor. It's fine. There was a wire across. I don't just do this for fun. This is a lot of hard work. It's hard to try to be entertaining and uh, accurate in real time, especially in videos that take me weeks to write. 
And so if, if any of you have ever told me about sharing stuff in class or with children, that is, aside from just being generally informative and entertaining, that is really, really special to me. So th thank you for sharing that with me, Steve. Um, someone's got to change the world. Someone's got to, someone's got to come up with the next thing. And it's not going to be, I mean, it's not going to be me. I'm too old. I'm not a hundred. What else does Chad have to say? I'm going to read it right off the monitor here. Right off this, this monitor. Edward Lott says, hair looking great. <laughs> Were you in any doubt, my man? Come on. I mean, it might be quarantine, but I'm still <laughs> maintaining. <laughs> Auriel, oh, I'm not going to pronounce your name correctly, but Aurieli, or Auriel, damn, asks, could we make a planet from packed snow? Would something special happen? Well, uh, snow is an interesting building material. Um, obviously, it works... Uh, to make igloos and, and things like that, or if you ever made like a snow tunnel as a kid. It's interesting as a material because it's solid, you can mold it, it's very ductile, pliable. And the cool thing about it is because, there, because there's so many air pockets when you try to pack snow together that uh, snow tends to be, packed snow tends to be a great insulator. That's why igloos work in the first place because they can hold a lot of heat. Even though it's very cold, it's very cold outside, it can still retain heat because it doesn't transfer it to the outside through its surface area very well because uh, the air inside of the snow is a good insulator. But when you have a lot of snow, Remember when we're talking about the compression that can happen from footsteps or an ice skate to compress the snow back into water because it was expanded into ice before and it would uh, compress itself and generate some heat and then uh, form back into water. Remember that. At a certain height of snow, if you have bricks of snow, say you're trying to build a building, just the weight of that snow on the bottomest brick will eventually have enough pressure, enough, uh, enough force per square area of the building to cause that compression to happen and it would melt. So there is a finite height and uh, depth and, and all this that you could build something out of packed snow because it would eventually melt at the bottom where the pressure would just be too much. Um, Every building material has this. I, I believe someone calculated it for Legos once, where it was like a mile high. You could have Legos like a mile high before the bottom Lego would, would start to squish. Uh, Syntexfy asks, how long do you think it would be before we have our first working nuclear fission reactor, fusion reactor rather, providing power to civilian homes? I think we're still quite a ways away from fusion power. I mean, there are interesting places. If you watch my Fallout video, where we went to the largest laser lab in the world, um, they are trying to create many fusion reactions, and they're doing so, but they're not getting more energy out than they're putting in. That is the holy grail, to start a fusion reaction and get more energy out of it than you put in, and you get an immense amount of energy out of it. If we solved nuclear, fis uh, nuclear fusion, rather, you know, slamming together two isotopes of hydrogen, for example, and getting a lot of energy, relatively speaking, out, uh, out of it, we would have unlimited energy, basically. And uh, one, of the, one of the analogies they told me and that I like to tell to people is that you can get... So imagine I took all of the water inside of this, uh, inside of this thermos and I used all the hydrogen in it in a fusion reactor. This water would be just this cup of water would be equivalent in energy to an entire train load of coal just this cup so if we had fusion reactors on the cheap and uh, they were successful and all that um, it would solve the energy problem simple as that but i think we are very very far out from this i mean nuclear reactors are big enough nuclear fission reactors are big enough rather now um, if you, the largest laser lab in the world creating mini fusion reactions that don't even produce excess energy is the size of three football fields. So while rapid progress could happen in these fields, I, I, is, it, is it even in our lifetimes? I don't know, but it seems, it seems like decades. New president says, new sub here. 
Well, I'm very happy to have you. You should check out the other uh, episodes on this channel every week. Hopefully, if you all like this, I will be doing office hours where you can ask me anything. We can talk about a number of fun things uh, happening in the world of science. I mean, we can even talk about punching planets and stuff. But go back to the channel and subscribe. Become part of the facility. Oh, and it, the, nerdy, the nerdiness never stops. Right now, in our Discord specifically, we are talking about everything. Like, I'm in, I'm in the Discord like 10 hours a day talking directly with you. It doesn't just stop here. Uh, Abdur asks, would you bring a matter beam in front of the camera? I, I don't control him or they. I, I don't control that entity. Matterbeam is someone I know online, and uh, they are one of the smartest people I've ever interacted with online. They run their own Discord, their own blog, their own everything, and they actually work for other uh, sciencey people already helping them out. So, um, also we're not also just socially distancing. No, that's not. No, no, no one's gonna come here. Although I might, I might telepre. If I check the wires back, yeah, I think. Yeah, I could telepresence with someone through this setup that I got going on here. Yeah, all right. Yeah, I could telepresence someone in. Should I get Adam Savage on the line? He's a nice guy. Uh, Alpha Wolves asks a question that I've been getting a lot, who says, due to quarantine, do you think we'll have environmental improvements uh, due to less human activity? Now... I've been asked this question so much that I think I could do something on it, but I, you know, I don't know quite enough. I haven't researched it. But as far as I understand it right now, the reductions year over year in terms of like carbon emissions, um, if you look at New York or Los Angeles or what have you, um, right now, based on this same time last year, the reduction in emissions has been like 30 to 50%. Absolutely incredible. So yes, there have been short-term benefits from benefits from quarantine if you're looking at carbon emissions as a benefit. However, it is very important to understand that the the environment, the atmosphere is a massive, unbelievably complicated system. And trying to steer the course of the environment and the atmosphere is like trying to steer the largest ship imaginable where you can turn the wheel very quickly, very hard, but you might not see the ship do anything or it takes a long time to do something. So right now we're seeing the effects of pollution from the industrial revolution. We haven't even seen the worst effects. It takes that long for the environment and the atmosphere to ingest the changes for a matter of speaking and, and present them to us. So one month worth of even, you know, 50% reduction one month is not enough time to steer this ship, and uh, if we do feel something from it, it's not going to be for a while. So, th I mean, this, this whole situation kind of makes you think in somewhat dire ways about what we're going to do about climate change, because if we can, if we're having problems just socially distancing ourselves, and this is a months-long problem, or a year, uh, 18 months-long problem before we have vaccines and antivirals, Imagine how we're going to react when climate change gets really bad for a long time. I don't know. Will humanity step up? It's possible. Uh, Gustavo, it's also not possible. Uh, it's possible that we might fail. Uh, Gustavo Colejo asks, uh, Kyle, your new channel reminds me a lot of Beekman's world. Where's the giant rat guy? That's exactly. So when I wanted to create a new environment, when I returned to the facility as the administrator, I kind of, I had a lot of uh, inspirations in my head from original Bill Nye, the Science Guy show, to Beekman's World, to Mystery Science Theater 3000. And I want to bring a lot of the influences that I've always liked but have never been able to put into my own work. I want to start to do that kind of thing now um, with characters and environments and little story bits here and there. So uh, thank you for noticing. That's, that's kind of what I like. Yeah, Holden Pope. Ask Discord question mark? Yes, if you join the facility through our Patreon page, which is patreon.com slash Kyle Hill, um, link in the description, uh, at a certain tier we have our Discord. We're like 600 or so people across dozens of channels are talking with each other 24-7, nerding out about stuff, um, showing pictures of their pets, giving me episode ideas, uh, creating their own canon. It's been, it's been really, really fun.
sorry for not talking for a second. I'm just looking at the chat. Getting pretty close to the end of our first uh, our first podcast here. Um, <laughs> there we go. Jabo Funtime in the chat. One of our security uh, staff members uh, has a link in the chat if you want to join us. But let's let's go with maybe one or two more questions. B Drill Fifteen asks uh, Aria, "What does Aria stand for?" Indeed. That information has not been revealed yet. Uh, Katie Stir Starling, Katie Starling asks, if the human population has to move to a new planet, do you think it's possible? There's many levels of what you mean by possible, right? Is it, is it technologically possible? We have rockets that can transport people to Mars, theoretically. Do we have habitats that can habitats? Do we have habitats that can sustain people long term on something like the Moon or Mars? Possible, maybe, maybe in you know a decade or a couple years if Elon Musk gets his way. Now think of it practically. It takes millions and millions of dollars just to launch, you know, payloads, non-human payloads into orbit. And even if you're launching human payloads, it's what, two to three to five people. Um, so the technology, practically speaking, that we would need to launch thousands. I mean, there's there's a billion people on the planet. If a rocket could take a thousand people to Mars, or what have you, and that's a think of the fuel for just a thousand people. A thousand people in a rocket, you have seven billion people. That's seven million trips. Okay, well, how long does the average, uh, what's the average time to put a launch together? A couple weeks, a couple months. Okay, so now you're multiplying a couple weeks or a couple months times a couple million. Uh-oh. Dozens and dozens of years, if not hundreds. So uh, practically speaking right now, I don't think we have the technology to move ourselves to another planet. Well, I think it's probably... Likely, we might establish some kind of outpost within our lifetime or something like that, something like the ISS, but on the moon or on Mars. I, I think that's much more likely, but to move an entire population of people to a planet, it would be, I think it would probably be easier just to uh, make our planet much more livable and, and to solve whatever problem it was, unless that was like a super volcano or an incoming meteor or something. That couldn't be Bruce willis as I like to call it. Uh, Spencer asks, how many po people would you need to start a human population on Mars? That's interesting because you are getting at uh, something that I, I think a lot of people don't think about, which is you need a certain amount of genetic diversity to maintain a stable population that doesn't have enough, mut that doesn't have so many mutations because of eventual inbreeding that the, the population can't survive. So there's some kind of population bottleneck. Um, this happens with endangered creatures sometimes when there's so few of them there isn't enough genetic variability in the gene pool that it won't definitely go extinct. And I don't know what that number is for humans. I'm guessing it's not five or whatever you usually see the teams consist of in movies. But one thing that you could feasibly do is um, freeze a lot of fertilized eggs, for example, and bring them along with you and have some kind of incubation process once you get there to um, kind of grow a population. Um, I think that's probably more possible, more... It seems more plausible than bringing millions of people to a planet, to me. C4 says, thanks, man, for all you do. Hey, just just doing what I feel like I can be doing at this time. That's all that can happen. McPiven asks, uh, says, the number is 4,500 people as far as I know. Well, I can't confirm or deny that number at the moment, but, you know, that seems that seems like a lot, which which makes sense to me. Yeah, uh, Peric, uh, Pariak McHugh says the cheetah came close to not having enough genetic uh, variability within its population to sustain itself, which is which is kind of terrible. Yes, exactly. Uh, Snow Ulf uh, says, like a portable cradle from Horizon Zero Dawn. Now, I won't give anything away if you haven't played Horizon Zero Dawn, but it's absolutely one of my favorite games in the last five years. If you haven't played and you have a PS4, you definitely should play it. It is, it is absolutely fantastic. Uh, 
Urin Doctor, this is gonna be our last question. Urin Doctor says, do you think you live in reality? So this is getting at this, the simulation argument, right? This was, uh, this was first really developed and popularized by a philosopher named Nick Bostrom, who does fascinating work. But basically he says that if you think it's possible in the future that we'll be so good at making simulations that future humans will create simulations of past humans, and they have enough computing power to make trillions of these situ of these simulations, the fully sentient, fully internal live people, billions of them on a planet. If they can make billions or trillions of these, of these simulations, the likelihood that you are currently living in base reality is one out of trillions or billions, which makes it, if you accept the premises, it makes it very hard to argue that you are living in base reality right now. I... I can't argue with him on those points, but I also doesn't. I also don't think it matters, because a theory that explains everything doesn't really explain a whole lot to me. Because there's no way out of the simulation. If if it's a perfect simulation, if the premise is that the simulation is perfect, it is completely indistinguishable from reality. Then it doesn't matter. If there's no way to test for it, no way to see it, no way to measure it, then it might as well be reality. Uh, it, it doesn't really explain much. We still have all the same laws of physics, all the, all the same things in our simulation, but then you're just trading the word simulation for reality. I don't think, I don't think it, it means all that much. It, it, it's a fantastic thought experiment. If you've never thought about that kind of reasoning before and the, the trilemma, not even a dilemma, the trilemma that is, uh, the, uh, the situation. But at the end of the day, I don't really, th I don't really think it matters. You're still living your life. You're still, it's not going to change your behavior. Um, and you can still be nice to each other because that's, that's, that's all we got. So with that, I hope you enjoyed uh, first office hours. I know many, many of you were asking questions. I will make improvements for the next office hours where we're trying to get to more questions, more topics. If you like this video, please uh, subscribe to the channel. It helps a lot. Uh, please like this video. It helps a lot. Share this. Um, and if you want to become a part of the facility, if you want to join me in here and have an x-ray taken like that guy or gal, I forget. There's a lot of test subjects in here. You can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill and you can join our discord and all of our wonderful nerds. I, I hope you like this. If you like this enough, I will be checking. Uh, we could do this again uh, same time next week. So uh, like I said, stay safe out there. Stay healthy. This has been a lot of fun for me. I'm outie.